We'll not only cover GPUs, but also some other things today. So people who are not attending will be missing a couple of other things too. But hopefully they'll see it after the exam on the website. <laughs> Uh, they say on the exam. <laughs> well, they, it will be on the exam too, actually. <laughs> Very likely. And I suggest that you solve the GPU questions that were on the exam last, last year. Uh, the same GPU question was on the first exam and the final, I think, or the second exam and the final. It's a very nice question. Has anybody solved it yet? It was on, it was on your homework, right, Archada? Oh, that's right, yes, because the homework is due today. <laughs> uh, but I'd suggest that you solve it still. Actually, it should be on the next homework. Why don't we put it on the next homework? <laughs> OK, let me see that, that set of lights. This is better, right? OK, all right, let's get started. First, a few announcements. You all know that midterm one is next week at this time although we'll start a few minutes earlier at 12.30. We'll likely take the entire two hours. Please come early so that uh, you don't disrupt the exam. It's closed book, closed notes. It's the same rules as the past exam, so you can read the rules from the past exams. No electronic devices allowed. And you can bring one letter side cheat sheet. And you can write it in any font if you want 0.3 or 0.2, as long as you can read it. Okay. And we'll test understanding, not memorization. So you don't need to write the LC3B ISA or ARM ISA instructions there. If we want you to think about them, we'll give you the ISA. We'll give you the necessary instructions. And one thing I would recommend is definitely study past exams and solutions. Actually, there's, uh, well, we'll, we'll, post, we'll post some suggestions later on. Uh, there's an email that I sent to last year's class that discusses what, what, to, what to study. You can probably pull that up, Archada, and we can post it. It's, it's in last year's exams. Let, let me actually take a look. We're going to get to this website. So if we search for CMU447, do you think we'll get the website for this semester? Looks like it. There you go. Isn't that nice? <laughs> So if you go to 447 from spring 13, if you go to exams, you'll find the exams. Actually, these are all the exams. And I'd suggest that you go and study all of these. Solutions are up also. I'd suggest that you first do the exam yourself and then look at the solutions. It's actually a nice question. I would suggest that you look at that question. This is one example question I'll just hit show you. This is the state of the reservation stations for the add and multiply in a processor during a particular cycle. X denotes an unknown value. And the question asks, what is wrong with this picture? It's up to you to figure out what's wrong. And I won't tell you, because it's fun to solve it. If you look at the solution first, it'll ruin it for you. So do the, do the question first. OK. And there's exam one information over here. Uh, We'll, we'll send a similar email, probably. But if you want to prefetch information, you can take a look at that. OK. So you have the benefit of actually having all the information from past classes online. So you can, you can use that. OK, any questions on the exam? OK. I'd suggest studying early and hard. OK, one other thing before the exam. Uh, we have a mid-semester feedback form that's mandatory to fill out because I really want everyone's feedback. Uh, it shouldn't take too much time, but I'd like to get your feedback on the course and how fast things are progressing before the course is over. You expected this to be fast anyway, so <laughs> mm. if, the, if the feedback is extremely fast, then we'll try to adjust. But if it's fast, then that's OK, probably. <laughs> that's why you're here, right? <laughs> OK, uh, you're required to return it by Monday. We, we sent an announcement saying that it's by Friday, but Monday is also fine, actually. You can return it earlier. Uh, we'd like hard copies, and you need to get checked off by me or the TAs so that we can ensure that you returned it. 
You can return it anonymously, or you can write your name. There's going to be no action if you write your name and say, this is a terrible course. That's fine. We can take criticism. <laughs> well, well, we'll put it in a ballot, a ballot box and forget about it. <laughs> that, that's the <laughs> or we're going, to, we're going to erase the TA's memory <laughs> who's, who's taking it in. But don't worry about it. That's, uh, this is just to get your feedback on how the lecture is going. What kind of videos do you prefer to watch if you watch any, for example? And please answer all the questions. If you look at the feedback form, let's see if this will work. What do you think? I clicked on it, and I'm sure my computer dies after this. Well, <laughs> it didn't happen, huh? All right. After 10 minutes, you'll get the PDF. <laughs> OK. Well, this is the lab for reminder that I've given you earlier. So oh, how many people started lab four? No one yet? OK. I'd suggest you, you, you have started? You have started. That's good. We have one person. So you'll do the extra credit too, right? <laughs> OK. So there are some GPU readings. Uh, these are two required readings that I mentioned in the past few lectures. But I also recommend some recent papers. It's a very hot area in computer architecture today. And if you take 740, we'll devote more time. Or 740 or 742, we'll devote more time to it. But if you're really interested, these are some of the papers that look at scheduling of the threads on GPUs. And uh, GPUs are becoming more and more general purpose as we go into the future. And today, you will see why uh, when we talk about the basic architecture. We won't be able to do justice to it, but uh, feel free to ask questions later on after you do the readings. OK. Any questions on logistics? Anything else I should cover, Rachada? That's it? OK. Homework 4 will be released today, right? Yes. Tonight. OK. But you're, you're busy with homework 3, probably, which is due today. Homework 4 is due on the 19th, I think, March 19th. But we can, we can change the deadline. The goal of homework 4 is partially to have you study for the exam. So there will be a lot of questions related to the exam. So I'd suggest starting homework 4 early and doing the questions relevant to the exam early as possible. Basically, exam will cover everything we covered this week and nothing on Monday. OK? OK. So graphics processing units are actually SIMD engines, except they're much more flexible SIMD engines. Uh, they're SIMD internally, but they're not exposed to the, the SIMD itself. Vector length, for example, is not really exposed to the programmer. And we'll talk about that. Programmer really doesn't program it as a SIMD engine. It, the programmer doesn't change the vector length, for example. The programmer really programmed it as more like a multiple instruction, multiple data engine. You basically write threads. and all threads happen to execute the same code. And we'll see how that is accomplished. It's actually a pretty simple concept. Uh, this is called SIMT, single instruction, multiple thread. Uh, I'm not going to cover the entire GPU. Actually, we could have many, many lectures on GPUs. But this is what a, high, uh, a GPU looks like at the high level. You have a bunch of cores. It could be called a shared shader core. I think NVIDIA calls it the streaming multiprocessor. Uh, and these cores are somehow, they have caches, and they're connected to an interconnection network, and they're connected to a bunch of memory controllers and graphics memory. We're definitely going to cover this later on. We're going to cover this later on. But let's take a look at the cores. What, the, what does the core look like? And there are a bunch of special purpose units in GPUs to accelerate graphics-related processing, like texture processing uh, or frame caches. But we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to focus on this more, more or less general purpose core that is like a SIMD engine, which looks kind of like this, basically. You have an instruction cache, a decode unit, and a bunch of scalar pipelines that happen to, in the same cycle, execute the same instruction. And that's how SIMD or SIMT is accomplished, single instruction, multiple thread. The same thread executes in the same cycle on these different scalar pipelines, except on different data elements. Does that make sense? The program writes a single thread, and that thread executes on different data elements on these different scalar pipelines. The programmer doesn't specify the vector length. The programmer doesn't need to change the vector length. Okay? 
basically, the programming model is very much like a multi-threaded program. It's a little bit different, but you just write a thread. And the GPU itself executes in a SIMD manner. So what is that collection of threads called? It's called a warp. Actually, it's called a wavefront by AMD, I think, or ATI, but it's called a warp by NVIDIA. I'll use the terminology warp. Uh, well, uh, basically, warp is a set of threads that execute the same instruction on different data elements, as I said earlier. And this is kind of the execution uh, model. Uh, basically, this is called SIMT, single instruction multiple thread. All threads run the same code. And they are scalar threads. The programmer writes a scalar thread. And I'll show you an example of it. Uh, and you have a thread warp that consists of a number of these threads, for example, 32 of them. And they have a common program counter, and they execute at the same time. Make sense? And this gets scheduled on a SIMD pipeline. So wh why is the terminology warp uh, nice? Because I guess NVIDIA played with this a little bit. Warp means the threads that run lengthwise in a woven fabric. If you think about it, you have these threads that are running in the pipeline together. And they happen to execute the same program, uh, program counter in the same cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah, a warp is, well, this is the definition of a warp from the uh, dictionary, actually. But a warp is a set of threads that have the same program counter and that are grouped together uh, at the same time. Make sense? It was like time warp or something. No, no, that's a different, that, that's a different meaning of the warp. <laughs> it's not used with that meaning. OK? So if you look at this, uh, it's not SIMD, right, from the, for the programmer. The programmer doesn't need to specify the vector length. In SIMD, there's a single thread. There's no notion of scalar threads. When you, there's no, uh, in SIMD, you write a vector instruction instead of this. Here, you have different threads that are grouped together. Let's take a look at how these threads are constructed. And actually, you can have many, many warps. You can have a warp over here that is executed at the same time with the same PC. Another warp that's executed at the, at the same time, uh, that executes n threads at the same time with a different PC. And these thread, these thread warps are multiplexed on the same SIMD pipeline. It's actually fine-grained multi-threaded. There's fine-grained multi-threading across the warps, as, as we will see in a second. Actually, I've shown you this picture before. right? So how do you actually form these warps, if you will? If you look at this vectorizable loop from the last lecture, uh, this is vectorizable because there's no loop carry dependency. Loop iterations, a loop iteration can be a thread, right? Basically, this small piece of code can be a thread. And if you think about this, you're really executing many threads at the same time. So if you actually vectorize this code, what happens is you form a vector instruction for these loads. You basically put the iterations side by side because they're independent. And you form a vector instruction for the load, vector instruction for the second load, vector instruction for the second add, vector instruction for the next store. That's what a SIMD machine, how a SIMD machine is programmed. On a GPU, you don't form the vector instructions. Basically, you specify this is the thread, right? And you specify which data it executes with. And to form a warp, you say, this is my thread, and this is going to execute data on elements uh, Basically, I'm, go I'm going to have a set of threads that are going to execute on, let, let us, let's assume a warp consists of 32 threads. Uh, these, uh, these 32 threads will execute the same piece of code on 32 different data elements. Basically, you partition this array across different warps. Each warp will execute on 32 el data elements. Data elements 0 through 31 will go to this warp. Data elements 32 through 63 will go to another warp, dot, dot, dot. Make sense? OK. That's ba this is basically what uh, this picture shows. Same instruction, different threads, uses the thread ID to index and access different data elements. So if you assume uh, an array of length 16 and four threads per warp, you get four warps. The first four warps will be executing on these, this part of the array. The next four warps will be executing on this part of the array, next one on this part of the array, and next one on this part of the array. Basically, you partition the array, and each warp executes on different parts of the array. Make sense? Yeah. 
it's the same thing as SIMD except program differently. Now you program a single thread. Programmer's life is much easier now. OK, I'm not going to go through the code examples. You can learn about this uh, online. At some point, we'll probably have a GPU programming and GPU architecture course that will go a lot more in depth uh, into this. But uh, one thing I'd like to point out in the code example over here uh, is it's very similar to the CPU code. If you look at this, this is what the CPU code looks like. Here, that CPU code is divided into this thread, basically. Now you have a thread, and you somehow specify that there are 100 threads. This is CUDA, NVIDIA's programming model. And this is how you get the thread ID. And basically, this is the code. It's very similar to this, except you need to specify the thread ID so that you can access the appropriate data. OK? You can learn about this online if you want to program CUDA. That's not the purpose of this course. And this is a little bit more complicated. OK, I'm not going to test you on these. <laughs> but everybody is uh, clear on the concept of thread warps, right? OK, excellent. So this is the same thing repeated over here. So how do, how do these thread warps now execute? Basically, uh, we don't have only one warp. Uh, if you think about a GPU, the width, the number of scalar pipelines in a GPU is the number of threads in a warp. And that could be 32, for example. So a thread warp can contain 32 threads. And you, you may be executing those 32 threads at the same time. The key is you'll be executing the same instruction uh, for, uh, for, from all of the threads in the same warp. So what happens, but 32 threads is not enough, right? What if you have, uh, this is designed for graphics. Uh, and assume that a thread is operating on a set of pixels, and you have millions of pixels. Obviously, you would like to have many, many thread warps. right? Uh, so a GPU actually consists of many, many thread warps. And what it does is it multiplexes those thread warps on the same pipeline. This is the same idea we've seen earlier, fine-grained multi-threading. Remember, in fine-grained multi-threading, uh, we, uh, we were fetching from one thread at a given cycle. And we won't fetch from that thread until an instruction from that thread completes. It's the same thing, except it's done for a set of threads now. It's done for the warps. We fetch from one warp at a given cycle. In the next cycle, we fetch from the next warp. In the next cycle, we fetch from the next warp. In the next cycle, we fetch from the next warp. And uh, once the first warp finishes execution in the pipeline, it gets ready for scheduling again, unless it takes a cache miss it needs to access memory, then it goes through this other scheduler that waits for memory. That's how a GPU works. It's a fine-grained multi-threaded engine. And it's fine-grained multi-threaded across these thread warps. Basically, it's fine-grained multi-threaded across groups of threads. Basically, it has all the benefits of fine-grained multi-threading. There's one instruction per thread in the pipeline at a time. No branch prediction needed. No data dependency checking needed. And warp execution is interleaved to hide latencies. And there are lots of warps, because hopefully your program is parallel enough. It has data parallelism, right? Uh, hopefully it's parallel enough uh, that you can tolerate long latencies. So this fine-grained multi-threading uh, enables long latency tolerance. When, uh, when a bunch of warps are waiting for memory, there are a bunch of other warps that are executing over here. Because hopefully graphics has millions of pixels you can operate on. Okay. Or you're, you're actually uh, working on huge vectors uh, that, uh, that enables you uh, to tolerate the latencies of some of the operations. And register values of all threads stay in the register file. So this register file actually is quite big. And it's very similar to what we've seen earlier in the vector pro or the array processor, right? Vector plus array processor, actually SIMD processor. The register file is partitioned. So you have a bunch of registers, but register 0 is here. Uh, one is here, two is here, three is here, four is here, dot, 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 right? So this, when this thread is executing over here, it can access only a, a set of registers. So it's really distributed and partitioned across these different pipelines. So you can think of these as really independent pipelines, right? One thread is executing here, another thread is executing here, another thread is executing here, and those, all th those threads belong to the same thread warp. The key is they're executing the same instruction such that when you fetch uh, for this thread, you don't need to decode. As, assuming that you have 32 threads in a warp, you don't need to decode 32 times. 
So you get the benefits of SIMD. OK. So what's the difference? I think I've given you the difference already. But warp-based SIMD, as we see in the GPU, is a little bit different from the traditional SIMD. Traditional SIMD really contains a single thread. When we talked about uh, that code example, we didn't have multiple threads, right? We actually, we actually had a single thread. And single thread is really lockstep, meaning uh, when you stall, when, when you need to access memory with a vector instruction, you basically stall. You don't go to the next instruction, right? Unless you do out of order execution on vectors, which is a totally different thing to do. You can imagine doing that too, of course. Uh, but then it gets rid of the, some, of the, some of the beauty of vector processing, right? Now you, things become more complicated again. Programming model is SIMD. There are no threads. Software needs to know the vector length, right? Uh, the programmer needs to uh, know the vector length. And ISA contains vector or SIMD instructions. In a GPU, that's, that doesn't need to be the case. In warp-based SIMD, you really have multiple scalar threads executing in a SIMD manner. Basically, multiple scalar threads where threads execute the same instruction. It does not have to be lockstep. When one thread stalls, another thread can go on. Right. And each thread can be treated individually now, because it has its own context. Meaning, this, this gives you some flexibility. Even though a thread is placed in one warp, you can move it to some other warp, assuming that warp has threads executing the same program counter. Right. This enables you to uh, tolerate latencies, as we will see soon. And actually, many GPUs employ this uh, to tolerate latencies today. Basically, this means that programming model is not SIMD, right? Because you have threads that can be treated individually, and threads are scalar threads. Okay? Which means that software doesn't need to, software or the programmer, when you're programming this machine, you don't really need to know the vector length. And it enables memory and branch latency tolerance because you can treat this individually. And I'll show you an example for the branch latency tolerance. I'll show you how a GPU handles branches. Uh, which is different from a, how, a, how a SIMD machine handles branches. And ISA scalar, you can think of this as vector instructions being formed dynamically. Right? And your, uh, the, the, the paper I've given you uh, explains this nicely also uh, on NVIDIA Tesla. OK. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this at you. Uh, but essentially, it's <coughs> SPMD programming model, which I'll explain in the next slide, implement on a SIMD hardware. SPMD is single program multiple data, basically, or single procedure multiple data. It's really a programming model rather than com computer organization. But basically, in this programming model, you write a thread that executes on different processing elements. They all execute the, uh, the same procedure, except on different data elements. Right. This is basically what we've seen. If you have that for loop, i less than n, let's say, i plus plus, basically you could treat this as really a parallel for. And let's assume that you have uh, four threads. Uh, what happens is each thread operates on one fourth of the array. Right? Does that make sense? You can do whatever over here. But basically, you can have each thread doing exactly the same thing that's specified by the for loop. But thread, uh, thread 0 will be operating on elements 0 through, I guess, n divided by 4 minus 1, right? Thread 1 will be operating on n divided by 4, uh, comma, what is that? n divided 2 minus 1, those elements, those indices. Thread 2 will be operating on n divided by 2, comma, 3 n divided by 4 minus 1. And thread 3 will be operating on 3n divided by 4. And then I guess that's n minus 1, right? Make sense? Basically, you're really partitioning the array. And each thread is operating on a different part of the array. Except they're doing exactly the same thing. Right? That's the idea of single procedure multiple data. And eventually, they do something at the end. Maybe they synchronize, right? Uh, they synchronize at certain points with the barriers. Uh, essentially, multiple instruction streams execute the same program. Right. So if you're adding arrays over here, AI plus BI 
equals ci. And you can imagine many, many different things over here. As long as this is vectorizable, you can partition the data of the threads. And each thread can do the same thing on different parts of the data, different indices. Now, this is a programming model uh, that enables each of these procedures to execute a different control flow path and work on different data at runtime. Right? Based, on this, uh, based on the data elements, the values of the data elements in these, these threads can actually go to different paths. Right? They're executing the same piece of code, but that doesn't mean that they're executing exactly the same instruction at the same time. Maybe you have some conditions over here. Maybe you have if, C, uh, if ai greater than 0, do this, else do this. right? Depending on which AI uh, is, uh, what is the data value in the, uh, stored in this array at location i, these threads can be executing different parts of the same code. Okay? So this enables flexibility. Uh, and many scientific applications are actually programmed this way. And this is a programming model because you can execute these threads on anything, right? If you have a multiprocessor, for example, a MIMD hardware, multiple instruction, multiple data, these different threads can be executing on multiprocessors. In GPUs, the programming model is very similar to this, except the hardware happens to be SIMD hardware or SIMD-like hardware. You don't really have multiprocessors. You really have this engine that is warp-based. OK? OK. OK, let's take a look at, uh, everybody clear on this so far? Am I going too slowly? Have you guys have programmed GPUs before? No? Some of you. Okay. Is it hard? <laughs> yeah? Believe me, it's much easier than a vector processor. <laughs> Cray1, <-1, for> example. <laughs> but yes, it's still not <laughs> as easy, probably. It should become better. OK. so. Let's take a look at, uh, I'll pictorially demonstrate the single procedure multiple data execution. Uh, well, we've already talked about the single instruction multiple thread execution. It's essentially the same thing. Uh, but if, let's assume that this is the piece of code that all threads are executing. That's, the, that's this loop, if you will, loop iteration. Thread 1 may be executing this. Thread 2 may be executing this. Depending on the data elements, it could be taking this path. Thread 3 may be executing this path. Thread 4 may be executing this other path over here. Right? They're executing the same piece of code, but they take different, part, different paths in the code because their data values are different. Right? Now, GPUs enable this. This is part of their flexibility. In SIMD, you need to deal with masking. Right? If you remember, how do you, how do you accomplish conditional execution, condition-based execution in SIMD? Remember the mask registers? You need to ensure that you change the mask and conditionally execute instructions based on that mask. So you have vector instructions that are executed based on the mask separately. So you program this such that you appropriate, appropriately set the mask register and based on that, execute vector instructions. In GPUs, it's much easier. You just write this thread. That's it. You don't deal with mask registers at all. You just write this thread, and these threads execute on different data values, except the hardware itself ensures that they all execute correctly. And they're part of the same thread warp. So how does the hardware actually ensure that they all execute correctly, given that they're getting different data values and they need to execute different control flow paths? Uh, well, we already talked about that. But basically, the problem is uh, what's called the branch divergence. These threads need to go to different directions based on their data value. And we want to execute them correctly without having the programmer deal with masks. Well, let's take a look at uh, how this uh, pr uh, problem occurs pictorially again over here. We have four threads over here. I'll show the threads over here in a warp. I think in, in this case it's eight. They all come to a branch. They execute the branch. And some of them will need to execute path A, and some of them will need to go to path B. What a GPU does is GPU has the hardware to detect which threads are going to path A, which threads are going to path B. And actually, at, at, after, at this point, when you execute the branch, you know, right? So GPU first executes the threads that will go to path A, 
And these assume that these are the threads that need to execute path A, depending on their data values. And then once those threads reach this reconvergence point, the GPU goes back and executes those threads that need to execute path B. And once those reach the reconvergence point, GPU merges these two and executes the warp as a whole again. Is it a little bit like predicated execution? It is a little bit like predicated execution. That's right. It's, it's, uh, it's actually doing multipath execution on different threads, right? It's predicating out these threads that should not execute. And I'll show you exa exactly how it's done. So, uh, the, so the predicate values of the threads that are executing in path A, these threads are false. All of those others are true. Yes? Say it again? That that's what the mask is. Exactly. That's what the mask is for. Mask is the predicate, essentially. Yes? But each thread has multiple data values in it, right? So what if some of them want to go to path A and some of them want to go to path B? That's uh, scalar. It's scalar. The thread is scalar, yes. There, there are no multiple data values for a thread. <laughs> OK. Yes? Absolutely, yes. Basically, it, it has the hardware to go to ensure that a correctness is maintained. I'll give you an example with two paths, but you can generalize that. OK. It's kind of nice, right? Now the programmer doesn't need to deal with masks at all. OK. Uh, so how does this work? Uh, let's take a look at this example. There's another example later on. But basically, GPU is a stack to, uh, to decide what, pro what, what threads should be executed at what program counter. Initially, when you start at this code, you have a warp that contains four threads. And all threads need to execute program counter A. Right? Here, there is no conditional execution. And this is the top of stack. What happens is threads execute those. And this is a timeline. Uh, assume that all threads are executing it. Next, assume that all threads go to instruction B. Next PC becomes B. This active mask specifies which thread should execute that instruction. Again, it's all ones. All threads execute that instruction. Next, it becomes more interesting. After threads execute B, the branch's direction, uh, the, each thread determines the direction of that particular branch based on its own data value. And some threads need to execute instruction D, and some threads need to execute instruction C. So once the GPU determines which threads are executing this versus this, it basically creates two entries in this stack and marks the threads that are executing instruction D with the, their active mask. So threads 1 and 2, in this case, 0, 1, 2, 3. 1 and 2 will be executing instruction D. And threads 0 and 3 will be executing instruction C. And it also marks the reconvergence PC. So there needs to be some support from the compiler that says re reconvergence point of this branch, where, the, where both paths of the branch merge is point E. OK? OK, so what happens next? Next, the GPU first takes the top of stack, next PC C, executes it for all of the threads in the warp, except active mask ensures that only those threads that have a 1 in the active mask commit their values. This is basically predicated execution, as you suggested. right? These threads are predicated out because their predicate values are 0. Once that's done, well, uh, the, the GPU checks if the reconvergence point is reached. It is reached, right? Next PC is E over here. After you execute C, you determine that it's E. Then you can get rid of this entry now because this, uh, this uh, part of the warp, and this stack is maintained per warp, actually. Uh, this part of the warp has reached. Next, the C GPU goes back uh, to execute uh, the part of the warp that actually uh, did not reach the reconvergence point yet. And that's uh, the set of threads that are executing D. And the GPU executes uh, the, program uh, the instruction at the program counter D. And again, uh, threads 1 and 2 are predicated true. All of the other threads are predicated false. And that's what happens over here. And once that's done, uh, this, this set of threads reach uh, program counter E. That's the reconvergence P PC. The GPU compares the next program counter to the reconvergence program counter. So you know that you've reached uh, the end of the hammock, if you will. 
and that uh, is removed. Now you can merge all those. You're back to this execution, right? And if you have another path over here, you can imagine that uh, you add, add more entries on the stack, right? OK? OK, now you're back to uh, E over here. And then all of the threads execute G. OK? So when the branch, uh, so GPU can handle this automatically. But when there is this branch divergence, you can see that the efficiency of the engine is not very high. Right? If all of the threads are executing on the same PC and the active mask is all one, which means that all the threads should execute that instruction, you're fully utilizing the SIMD engine. Assuming that you have four functional units, you're fully utilizing. But when the branch divergence happens, you're utilizing the machine 50% over here. Right? Only 50% of the threads are really executing. So we'll try to solve that problem. This is another example. I'm not going to go through this, but this gives you a code base example of how this works. I'll let you uh, take a look at it on your own. But it's the same thing, essentially, except for a simpler piece of code. OK. Any questions? It's kind of nice, right? It's dynamic predicate execution, basically, in a simple way. Uh, you can imagine what kind of support you need from the compiler. The compiler actually needs to provide the reconvergence PC. OK. So uh, I've, I've told you that uh, the efficiency becomes low. So imagine that you have many, many control flow paths, and only one thread is executing out of. So modern GPUs have 32 threads in a warp. And it may increase going into the future. If only one thread actually takes the branch, you still need to execute it by itself, right? So your efficiency, you're utilizing for, for that particular threat at that point in time, you're utilizing only one functional unit out of 32 functional units. That's terrible efficiency, right? So uh, people have, uh, researchers as well as uh, designers, have proposed mechanisms to make it much more efficient. Uh, and the idea is dynamic warp formation. Remember, we have many, many warps. And they may be executing the same PC. So if one thread from this warp is executing B, and no other thread from this warp is executing B, maybe it's a good idea to look at some other threads that are executing B and merge them into the same warp dynamically. You can do this now because programming model is very flexible. You have scalar threads. Right? That's the idea of dynamic warp formation. Dynamically merged threads executing the same instruction after branch divergence, of course. And the idea is form new warp at divergence. If you have enough threads branching to each path, then you can now create full new warps and execute them. Instead of executing one thread per warp, maybe you can fill it out with 32 threads per warp. That's the idea. And pictorially, it looks like this. Uh, I think, for example, one of the NVIDIA machines has 32 threads per warp and 32 warps in a streaming multiprocessor in a shader core, which means that you can actually scan all of those 32 warps to figure out which ones are executing the same program counters. And if you find something like this, one warp has these four threads executing program counter A, another warp has these three threads executing program counter A, and they happen to align nicely in the lanes. Remember, lanes are important because register files distribute it. Only uh, this thread over here can access these registers. And this thread over here can access these registers. But this thread over here cannot access the registers in this lane over here, if you remember that picture from uh, last time. This is nice because now this warp has holes for which this warp's threads can fit. Now you can combine these together, right? Because they're all executing the same program counter on different lanes. And now you have an almost full warp. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of eight, right? Instead of executing two warps with very low efficiency, four out of eight and three out of eight, you execute one warp with seven out of eight efficiency. Does that make sense? That's the idea. It's beautiful, actually. In this case, you cannot do it, though. Again, you have these warps and this one. Actually, this could have been uh, done in a nicer way, but that's OK. So you cannot combine these warps to actually form a single warp. 
Uh, yes. If you're willing to relocate like two completely different warps, why can't you relocate within a specific warp? Because there's still enough room in the second one. It's just it overlaps with. Oh, well, you mean this one? Yeah. Right. That's what you're saying that you can't put them together because they overlap. So there are two reasons actually why you cannot uh, put these together because you have eight. You have space for eight, and you really have nine over here. You cannot combine all of them in a single warp. But the second reason, even if, even if it were eight, because these overlap, you cannot put them together. Because uh, these threads are accessing the registers in this register file, right? Because register file is partitioned, remember? Yes. Yeah, that's the reason. If you read the paper that has proposed this, you can complicate the hardware and enable these threads to access that reg any register file, in that case, you could relocate anywhere. The problem with that is it's much more complex in terms of register file access. Instead of only this lane accessing this register file, now you need to have every lane accessing every register file, which requires a crossbar, as we will see later on. OK? OK. But if you have this one, now you can merge. That's the beauty. Does that make sense? Now you can merge these three warps to become two. And since you have lots of warps, this merging uh, becomes more efficient as you increase the number of warps. Yes? So are these warps all happening at the same time that you can do this? Yes, that's right. Because uh, you have many warps that are ready to execute. And many of them have the same program counter. And they cannot all execute in the same pipeline because the pipeline is really not uh, deep. So this okay. happens like in the decode stage, pretty much. Like so uh, yeah, this, uh, this happens actually before the decode stage at the scheduler. If you remember the picture uh, early on, before the warps are scheduled, you can really merge them. You're asking good questions. These are really uh, interesting design issues. OK, that's the idea, basically. Uh, let's take a look at, the, actually, pictorially, how this uh, improves performance. So you have this warp. It's waiting to execute. Normally, it would execute like this. It's taking path A. And you have another warp that's also taking path A. Now I can merge these warps to form that. OK. Let's take a look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is our piece of code. And we have two warps, warp X uh, executing at basic block A, and warp Y again executing at basic block A. That's the beginning. And because both of the warps are executing this basic block A, uh, unconditionally, their active masks are 1. In the baseline, this is what execution would look like. Basically, the warps are interleaved. Right? You execute from uh, warp x and warp y in an interleaved manner. Okay? And they happen to diverge. So this shows warp x, uh, three of the threads in warp x execute b, but one of them executes f. Uh, two of the threads in warp y execute b, two of them execute y, and then later, uh, one of the threads in x execute c, two of them execute uh, x, one of the threads in y execute c, and one of them execute d, dot, dot, dot. Right? In the baseline, it looks like this. And the takeaway point, if you follow all of this, is you will see that there are a bunch of execution cycles, if you will, where the SIMD pipeline is not utilized well. For example, in this case, warp x is executing uh, basic, uh, c over here, but only one thread is active. Warp y is executing c in the next cycle, but only one thread is active. Warp x is executing d, only two threads are active. Warp y is executing d, only one thread is active, and dot, dot, dot. If you do dynamic warp formation, this is what execution would look like. Basically, you can create a new warp from scalar threads of both warp x and warp y, uh, executing at any basic block, actually. So this is the first cycle. That's fine. You, don't need, you cannot combine anything because you're at full efficiency. In the next cycle, you know that both of the threads will execute B, well, both of the warps will execute B. Now you can, uh, the hardware tries to combine best, but it cannot combine them into a single warp, right? Because these happen to have five threads total. So you still execute two warps, one of them with less efficiently. But here, now you can combine these two warps, warp X and warp Y. They're they're both, they both need to execute C. And they both have threads at different lanes. Now they're combined. So you say one cycle. Similarly for this, 
you say one more cycle. E, these, even though these two are combined, you cannot save, save a cycle because you have too many threads. Again, you can combine uh, when, the, when both warps execute f. Right? So you say one more cycle. And the rest is uh, full warps. Does that make sense? Yes? So if the programmer is like dumb and makes it so that like they're, it's executing in like a certain domain, uh -huh. then they can't combine it at all. So it's, it's like empty slots. That's a, that's a good question. Who, who, uh, is, is that dependent on the programmer, or is that dependent on the data values? It really depends. But usually, it's really the data values that determine the path. Because, because there is some data value in this thread, it goes through path C versus path D or path E. So it's difficult for the programmer to estimate which lane a warp will go to. It's not exposed to the programmer. But yes, data values, if the data values happen to be such that threads all align <laughs> at the same lane, then yes, this won't do too well. OK. Yes? Is it possible to combine more than two into one? So oh, yeah. you still have some more left that you could combine. <coughs> That's right, exactly. Here, this example shows only two warps to simplify the example. But yes, it's first, uh, certainly possible. It complicates the hardware more. But if you want more efficiency, you, you may want to do that. Okay. But this is not exposed to the programmer, by the way. So you act, this is all done by the hardware. OK. It's, it's fun, right? So people have proposed other mechanisms to handle branch divergence much better. And some of the, uh, the papers I, that I referenced uh, discuss some of the techniques that are employed in existing GPUs, or proposed techniques that hopefully will be employed in future GPUs. OK. OK. Let's see. Good, we have time. Uh, there's another issue that I will not cover in detail, but uh, modern GPUs actually have caches. We haven't covered caching. Uh, one of the problems in SIMD engines in general is memory bandwidth. Right? You have lots of data, and you need to access all of that data. And uh, memory bandwidth is a problem, and it becomes a bottleneck, as we've seen before. In the code example that I've showed you earlier, we needed to add more ports to memory. GPUs are the same. If you're actually processing a billion pixels, you're limited by the memory bandwidth. And to reduce the memory bandwidth requirement, GPUs actually employ caches. So the reason GPUs employ caches is not to speed up the execution of a single thread, really. Because single thread is not that important in a GPU. You have lots of parallelism, lots of parallel threads. Right? You can tolerate the latency of a single thread with, by executing many, many threads. But there is, the reason they employ caches is to reduce the bandwidth requirements going into main memory, because that's a very precious resource. If you can exploit the locality in a single thread, <coughs> such that that thread doesn't need to access memory, you're saving a lot such that, uh, because you're enabling some other threads to access memory. You're not wasting valuable memory bandwidth. So that's, the caches are exactly the same in CPUs, but the reason caches are employed in GPUs is very different from in CPU. It's not for latency reduction, because latency is less important, but it's for bandwidth reduction, reducing the bandwidth going off chip. Well, but caches introduce another divergence issue. Now, what may happen is you have these different threads in the same warp. Some of the threads may hit in the cache. Some of the threads may miss in the cache. Well, what do you do, right? Because those threads that hit in the cache can really proceed. But those threads that miss in the cache need to wait for the data. So ideally, you would like all threads in the warp to hit without conflicting with each other. Well, this is the problem. Uh, you can do similar things, actually, uh, to combine threads that hit in the cache, right, such that they can execute. So to, com to combine threads that hit in, the, hit in the cache and that have the same program counter into the same warp, such that they can execute, and combine other threads that miss in the cache and they, that have the same program counter to wait. And that's the idea of memory divergence and hand, uh, handling of memory divergence. Basically, you can do something similar for memory divergence handling. Okay, I'll not go into this in detail, but this is to uh, get you thinking. There are a lot of issues like this in GPUs. Ideally, you would like to keep the pipeline moving and uh, you'd like to preserve regularity such that threads that are executing the same code can keep, keep proceeding without stalling. 
In SIMD, if one of the elements uh, in, uh, in, your, uh, in your vector miss in the cache, or if you need to wait for one of them, too bad, you stall, right? With GPUs, you have this flexibility of moving one thread to another warp, such that you don't need to stall, or you minimize stalling. OK. Any questions? Okay. Let me cover an example GPU at a high level, uh, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll continue with VLIW. So this is actually an old GPU by now. <laughs> but well, I guess we'll do. Uh, this has 240 stream processors. I think that's NVIDIA speak. <laughs> but uh, generically, unfortunately, I think NVIDIA calls processors a functional unit of processor, which I disagree with. A functional unit should not be a pro processor, right? A processor is something where you can actually program and execute a code. But basically, it has 240 stream processor but, uh, with 30 cores and 8 SIMD functional units per core. Still pretty powerful. Uh, and one of the cores looked like this. Basically, you have a SIMD functional unit. Control is shared across eight units. And you have these functional units inside. Decode is shared across all of the threads, basically, all of the units. That's the benefit. You, you have a lot of efficiency because you're really combining the same instructions to be executed on different functional units. Execution contexts are pretty big because you need to have lots of threads, actually. Uh, in this particular machine, you have 64 kilobytes of register storage, which is quite large if you think of uh, how it compares to a CPU, right? In, in a CPU, you have 32 registers, let's say. And 32 registers times 4 bytes is only 128 bytes, I think, if your uh, registers are 32 bits. Whereas here, you have 64 kilobytes because you have many, many threads. And you have groups of 32 threads that share the instruction stream. Basically, this is a warp. A warp consists of 32 threads. Well, now you're going to say, wait a second. A warp actually consists of 32 threads, but we have only eight functional units. Right. You can really execute only eight operations in a cycle. Well, what they do is actually uh, they, a warp executes over multiple cycles over the functional units. You have 32 threads. The first eight threads execute on, this fun uh, on these functional units, and then the next eight threads, and the next eight threads, and the next eight threads, and the warp is done for that cycle. And then the next warp gets scheduled. And there are up to 32 warps that are simultaneously interleaved. The pipeline is not 32 deep. The pipeline is much shallower. But there are 32 warps that can be interleaved to tolerate memory latency and to do merging of the warps. Okay. Which means that 32 times 32 is 1,024, right? So there's storage for 1,024 thread context over here. That's a lot. OK? And this is what the entire machine looks like. So you have, this is one of the cores, and you have 30 of these, which means that you can actually execute uh, 30,000 30, plus threads at the same time. The good thing is they don't happen to be, they don't need to execute the same instruction at the same time. Only the warps need to execute the same instruction at the same time. These all can be the same threads, but they could be executing different pieces. Make sense? OK. I could have actually done the same thing for some AMD processor, but for the sake of time, let's take a short break here. Any questions before we take the short break? OK. Let's take a short break for, let's see, five minutes uh, in order execution, auto order execution, pipelining, all of those. You cover data flow, which one of you aptly observed that it's a MIMD execution model, because there's no single flow of control, right? Uh, we've covered SIMD, uh, different kinds of SIMD, vector processing, array processing, GPUs. Now we're going to go back to the SysD model, single instruction, single data, and try to look at some other methods of exploiting uh, parallelism. And VLIW is one of them. Uh, well, I think I've kind of summarized this. We've covered uh, SIMD. We've, we're going to cover SysD a little bit more. Single instruction operates on single data elements. And we're going to cover MIMD later on when we talk about multiprocessors. Fine grain multi threading is one example. Actually, GPUs exploit MIMD as well, right? Across different uh, warps and across different cores, across different threads. You can combine all of these at the same time. <laughs> 
And we're going to cover MISD if, if time permits today. Well, MISD-like. It's hard to call uh, something MISD. OK, let's take a look at SISD again, single instruction, single data. We've already seen superscalar and out of order execution. Uh, the key question people have asked for a long time is, are there simpler ways of extracting parallelism out of a single instruction stream where instructions operate on single data elements? And uh, we're going to look at VLIW, very long instruction word architectures, which we've talked about brief briefly. And we're going to also look at decoupled execu access execute. Uh, you know the concept of VLIW before. Basically, you have a very long instruction word that consists of multiple instructions that are packed together by the compiler and that are ensured to be independent. Right? Contrast this with superscalar execution. Right? In superscalar execution, hardware fetches multiple instructions and ensures that they're executed correctly because those instructions can be dependent instructions. Here, the compiler packs the instructions to be independent. Packed instructions can be logically unrelated. This is the main difference from SIMD. Right? In SIMD, packed instructions have to be the same right? in a vector instruction. Right? You can think of a vector instruction packing many operations, except they're the same, exact same operation performed on different data. Basically, compiler finds independent instructions and statically schedules or packs or bundles them into a single VLIW instruction. The traditional characters, the goal is to simplify the hardware as much as possible. Very similar to RISC. The philosophy, as we will see later, is very similar to reduced instruction set computing. You have multiple functional units that can be exploited in parallel. Each instruction in a bundle, or in this very long instruction word, can be execu uh, is executed in lockstep. So you don't do out of order execution traditionally. Basically, if one instruction stalls, the entire pipeline stalls. It's the compiler's job to reorder instructions to ensure that you get the maximal performance. And instructions in a bundle are statically aligned to be directly fed into the functional units. So the compiler knows the structure of the hardware and puts the load instruction to the right lane, if you will, using SIMD terminology, such that when the hardware fetches that load instruction, that load instruction directly goes into the load unit. When the hardware fetches the add instruction, that add instruction directly goes into the add unit. Make sense? Yes? So do you have as many lanes as functional units? Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's correct, actually, yes. But there could be multiple functional units in the same lane. And the hardware has some decoding. To actually, you can add the, have the adder and multiplier in the same lane, for example. And once the hardware decodes it, uh, it's the compiler's job to place the instruction to the, functional, to the lane that has that functional unit. OK. So this is the concept. Uh, I, th I think I've shown you this before. But basically, with a single program counter, you fetch multiple, a very long instruction word that contains multiple operations that are independent of each other. And they are fetched, and they're basically decoded, and they go to the functional units uh, directly. So the compiler, if this processing element doesn't, cannot execute a load, the compiler doesn't place a load over here. Make sense? OK. Well, that's the idea. And this is the paper that I actually uh, gave you an excerpt on before, right? Uh, it's called Very Long Instruction Word Architectures and the ELI 512. ELI is actually enormously long word instructions. It was 512 bits. This is in the paper. This is Josh Fisher introduced the concept of VLIW. And it's been employed in many processors since. We'll take a look at that. But this is a fun paper to read. I would definitely recommend that. <laughs> I'll give you more excerpts right now. But think about an instruction today, right? It's 32 bits around. In x86, it's, uh, the biggest instruction is actually 15 bytes or 16 bytes. Even that's smaller than 512 bits. And we'll see a machine that was designed to execute 28 instructions per cycle. So your VLIW has 28 operations instead of four over here. OK, contrast this with an array processor. We've done this contrast before. But in an array processor, this is what we have. You uh, have the same program counter and a vector instruction. And that generates more oper multiple operations, but they're on different data elements. It's the same operation on different data elements. As I told you, the philosophy of VLIW is very similar to RISC. You have simple instructions and simple hardware. Except now we do multiple instructions in parallel. Remember RISC? We've talked about that earlier, right, when we talked about ISA. Uh, the idea the originally developed by John Cock was compiler does the hard work to translate the high-level language code to simple instructions. In fact, 
he had this crazy idea of a compiler generating all the control signals on the machine, right? That enabled a lot of good compiler research. VLIW, actually, we'll see that it's very similar. People have tried to d develop compilers for VLIW that enabled a lot of good compiler research. And a lot of the compiler uh, compilation methods that are used in GCC today was enabled because of this. Uh, and we'll see that in the next lecture, actually. Uh, okay. Basically, the compiler needs to reorder simple instructions for high performance and risk, so that we don't get pipeline stalls, right? We've seen this. And hardware does little translation or decoding. It's very simple, right? In fact, initial risk engines did not even have multiply instructions because of that. VLIW, again, the compiler does the hard work to find instruction level parallelism, to pack multiple instructions in the same very long instruction word, also to ensure that the pipeline doesn't stall. So now the compiler's job is even harder. It doesn't need to only ensure that the pipeline doesn't stall, but also needs to pack multiple instructions to be executed concurrently in the same cycle without any hardware dependency checking between those instructions. Again, hardware stays as simple and streamlined as possible. In a sense, it's beautiful, right? SIMD is beautiful because the hardware is simple. It's you're exploiting data parallelism. This is beautiful because, again, hardware is simple because the compiler is exploiting independence across instructions. Each instruction in a bundle is executed in lockstep. Basically, if you have multiple instructions, these two, these totally unrelated instructions, if this load stalls, well, too bad. None of these other instructions can continue. And nothing that comes after can continue. Okay. The result is hopefully a simple design, hopefully a higher frequency design, hopefully a processor that's easier to design. Right? Now, people have, have strived for this for a long time. Let me give you an excerpt from uh, this paper that I would definitely recommend you to read. It's not required, but uh, uh, Fisher says, more formally, the LIW architectures have the following properties. There is one central control unit issuing a single, ins single long instruction per cycle, SISD. Each long instruction consists of many tightly coupled independent operations. Each operation requires a small, statically predictable number of cycles to execute. Well, this is very difficult to satisfy, right? What happens if you have a cache and a load? It's not statically predictable anymore. Now, that's, that's the fundamental difficulty with any kind of compiler-based scheduling, as we've discussed, right? And we'll discuss more in the next lecture how to try to overcome that. Operations can be pipelined. These properties distinguish VLI WS from multiprocessors and data flow machines. Basically, multiprocessors have large asynchronous tasks, threads. And data flow machines do not have a single flow of control, and they do not have the tight coupling. Instructions are not coupled together, right? An instruction is fetched and executed. It's a node when state elements are ready. Uh, VLIWs have none of the required regularity of a vector processor or true array processor. And this is true. And I've shown you uh, this earlier, right? When we, there's, there's no need for the hardware to be regular in this case, uh, like this. OK. Uh, I think I won't talk a whole lot about VLIW, but we'll talk about static instruction scheduling uh, in the next lecture, which was actually developed a lot for, uh, mainly for VLIW engines. Uh, but there have been many commercial VLIW machines, many, some of them commercially successful. In the general purpose domain, unfortunately, they haven't been commercially successful. Uh, Multiflow Trace, Josh Fisher, after he uh, wrote, uh, uh, he was a professor at Yale when he developed the concept of VLIW, and then he started this company called Multiflow uh, to commercialize the idea. And initially, he built a 7-wide seven, seven machine and then a 28-wide machine, which is huge, right? Today, we don't see 28-wide machines. If you, the, the processors that you have are 4-wide. And the biggest that was actually designed that didn't see the, well, I, I guess IBM power machines were 8-wide. So they, they did see the uh, light of day. But they consume a lot of power. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bob Rao, at the same time, uh, developed Sidrom, Sidra 5. These were uh, the first initial VLIW machines. And the goal was general purpose markets, but they, didn't, they weren't very successful for the reasons that we will see next in the next slide. Uh, we talked about transmitter, right? What they did was they took x86 code and they translated it to VLIW instructions to simplify the hardware. And initially, they wanted to get very high performance out of it. It turned out that it was difficult for the reasons that we will talk about in the next slide again. But they were power efficient, relatively power efficient, because the hardware was relatively streamlined. 
where VLIW has been very successful is basically embedded processors, digital signal processing and embedded processors, because people actually eked out all of the independent instructions when they compiled their code or when they wrote their code. So you see TIs, a lot of TI's processors, a lot of ST micros processors, Trimedia's processors uh, to have VLIW execution. Have you, have you programmed these processors? Probably not, right? OK. If you look at TI's DSPs, they're all VLIW, unless they've changed recently. Uh, we'll talk about Intel IA64 briefly when we talk about static scheduling. Intel IA64, how many of you know IA64, the Itanium architecture? No one? You've heard of it. You guys are too young. <laughs> this was uh, developed. Uh, so Intel actually wanted to design a different ISA to, uh, to make the ISA 64 bits. And while making the ISA 64 bits, they had this idea of actually completely revamping the ISA, which turned out to be pretty not a great idea for them, because they had a huge software base on x86, right? Whenever you want to change the completely revamp the ISA, you need to consider that software base. Uh, and they developed this Itanium architecture uh, that, is, that was 64 bits. That's what IA64 stands for. And they wanted to give a lot of freedom to the compiler to actually exploit the hardware. And this was based on VLIW principles, but it was a much more complicated engine. It was not fully VLIW. Uh, we'll cover this in static instruction scheduling. But this is called explicitly parallel instruction computing by some. In this case, Again, compile packs instructions into, I guess, what's called an epic operation. <laughs> uh, a lot of people have uh, made fun of this. <laughs> I won't go into that, but uh, I think it's a, it's, it, it, was a, it was a great design in the sense that it was very radical compared to what Intel was doing at the time, except it wasn't successful commercially. Well, one could argue that it was successful at a very specific market commercially. But basically, instruction bundles can have dependent instructions. Now this is going against the philosophy of VLIW, right? You have instruction bundles. But one of the problems with VLIW is extracting parallelism, co co figuring, coming up with these instructions that are independent. If the compiler cannot find them, what does it put there? You know that very well now, right? No ops. Well, how do we get rid of no ops? We can have the. Instruction bundles have dependent instructions. And furthermore, we can have the compiler specify which instructions are actually dependent on each other, assuming these are register dependencies. Right. Now the hardware has less of a difficulty identifying those dependencies, because the compiler tells which instructions in the bundle are dependent on which other ones. So it's somewhere, somewhere in between superscalar and VLIW in that sense, right? You don't require independent instructions, but the compiler tells which instructions are dependent. So this is another machine that was based on VLIW principles. Okay. We'll cover this a, a, a little bit more detail in the next lecture. So what are the trade-offs? What is the big advantage of VLIW? Yes. No. No? <laughs> you can still take a shot. OK. Yes. Well, it's like the same thing as before when you decouple, when you have the decoupled process. Um, the compiler figures out how mm -hmm. to reorder Yes. appropriately without having that hardware overhead. Exactly. The hardware is simple, basically, right? No need for dynamic scheduling hardware. Otherwise, the hardware needs to do dynamic scheduling. So hardware is simple. No need for dependency checking. This is actually going to be very similar. No need for dependency checking within a VLIW instruction. As opposed to superscalar processing, uh, you, need, uh, uh, you need dependency checking within the fetch bundle, if you will, right? The number of instructions you fetch. If you fetch 16 instructions per cycle, you need to check for dependencies. And there's no need for renaming also. I'm not going to talk about this, but a lot of compiler techniques have been developed to rename instructions at compile time. A lot of VLIW processors have support uh, to aid that renaming a little bit. There's no need for instruction alignment and distribution after fetch to different functional units. This is what I've discussed a little bit earlier. The compiler ensures that. An instruction uh, is located in the right place, such that it can directly flow into the functional unit needs. There's no need for this crossbar, if you will, because not all uh, instructions do not need to go to every functional unit. The compiler ensures that that doesn't happen. So simple hardware is the biggest well, uh, advantage. The disadvantage I think I've given you already. <laughs> 
basically, this is difficult, right? Compiler needs to find n independent operations per cycle. And we've seen how difficult it is before. And we're going to see how, uh, some techniques to overcome it in the next lecture. If the compiler cannot find it, it inserts no ops in a VLIW instruction. Well, too bad. You've reduced your efficiency now, right? You're, you have a 28 white pipeline. If you find only four independent instructions, you're really utilizing four out of 28 of your functional units. This leads to a parallelism loss. And it also leads to code size increase, because you somehow need to encode those no ops, right? Now, people have tried to reduce that code size. This is a less fundamental problem, because you can encode the no ops more efficiently. You don't need to actually put a no op. You can say, the next 28 instructions are no ops. Right. Okay. Uh, another disadvantage is the disadvantage that you have whenever you tightly couple uh, the compiler with the microarchitecture, right? Basically, the compiler now needs to know the latencies of the instructions, how long the pipeline is, and once uh, and the execution width, obviously. Once any of those change, once the execution width changes, instruction latencies change, functional units change, you need to recompile to get better performance. If your execution width goes from 7 to 28, you need to recompile. Right. If your functional units get arranged in a different way, you need to recompile or make the hardware more complex. Right. This is very much unlike superscalar processing because hardware handles everything in superscalar processing. Right. And we've discussed this. Lockstep execution causes independent operations to stall. If you have a load in the instruction bundle, that load cannot proceed. Right. No instruction can progress until the longest latency instruction completes. And lockstep execution is nice because that keeps the hardware simple. Once you start uh, reordering instructions, or uh, once you get rid of this lockstep property, you need to handle uh, more in hardware. We need to have a reorder buffer, for example, right? OK. Any questions? It's a beautiful concept, right? Okay. It's beautiful because it simplifies the hardware. The problem is it requires complex compiler techniques. And uh, the solely compiler approach of VLIW has several downsides that reduce performance. Uh, well, I'll give you some of these. Too many no ops we've discussed. If the compiler cannot discover enough parallelism, it puts no ops. Well, we've already talked about this also. Static schedule is intimately tied to microarchitecture. Code optimized for one generation performs poorly for next, usually. If you find seven independent instructions, you need to find 28 in the next, next one. Uh, no tolerance for variable or long latency operations because of lockstep. Basically, these three disadvantages lead to poor performance. As a result, VLIW has not been very well has not been successful in the general purpose domain. In the special purpose domain, like DSPs, digital signal processors, where people can find overcome some of these issues, it has been relatively successful. The upside, the big upside of VLIW architecture has been the compiler optimizations that have been developed as a result of this effort uh, for push for VLIW. Most compiler optimizations developed for VLIW are employed in today's compilers, today's optimizing compilers, for superscalar comp compilation, actually. Because if you think of a superscalar engine, if you do the same optimizations for a superscalar engine, you can get some benefit right? if you do that reordering. Because you can tolerate latencies much better. Hardware will tolerate the latencies, but with the compiler's help, you can tolerate the latencies much better. And VLIW has been successful in embedded markets, as I discussed. OK, so we'll see these code optimizations in the next lecture. How do, uh, any questions? OK. Let's look at another effort to actually simplify the hardware. It's, it's actually fun, too. Some of the concepts are actually employed today, but not in the same form. It's called decoupled access execute. And the motivation at that time at the time this was developed was Thomas O's algorithm was too complex to implement because the, the hardware resources are precious. Even though IBM 3691 has implemented it, uh, IBM is a big company. Right? Uh, it's, if you want to scale the instruction window size, it becomes complex to implement, as we've discussed earlier. And this was developed in the 1980s before Pendium Pro. Uh, 
And the idea was rel relatively simple. Can we get some of the benefits of Thomas Law's algorithm, out of order execution, with a fraction of the hardware cost? And the idea is decouple operand access and execute into two separate instruction streams such that they can slip compared to each other. You can do out of order execution across these two different streams. And that's it. You cannot execute any instruction independently, but if the access stream is running ahead, is going faster, for example, than the execute stream, or vice versa, these can execute out of order. Make sense? And these two streams communicate via ISA visible queues. So the compiler, again, is involved here. And this is what the machine kind of looks like. Uh, this is one design. Uh, you have an access processor and an execute processor. Access processor's main job is to access memory, read and write. Uh, and you have an instruction stream executing here. You have the access processor register file over here. And you have a write queue over here. And access processor can supply data to the execute processor through the access execute queue, such that the execute processor can execute, let's say, let's say do a floating point operation on that data. And it has its own register file. And execute processor can supply data to the access processor through the execute access queue, such that that data can be written to memory. And these queues are actually much more scalable than what you need in Thomas Law's algorithm. Remember the tag matching logic in Thomas Law's algorithm? Well, you don't need that here. This is basically a simple queue, FIFO queue. You can make them huge, right? It's just a FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, well, there's, there's these other queues, access, execute, branch queue. Some branches are executed here. Some branches are executed here. And for branches, these two need to synchronize, right? Because you're really dividing a single instruction stream into two separate instruction streams, access and execute. Okay? And if, if one of them executes a branch, you need to notify the other one uh, such that it doesn't keep executing the, on the wrong path. Okay? It's kind of a nice idea. And this is the paper. I didn't require you to read it, but this is a nice paper also. This was proposed in 1982 by Jim Smith. Uh, OK, so what does this kind of look like? A compiler generates two instruction streams, A and E. I guess it was called A and X over here. I guess X is kind of nicer, execute. Uh, and compiler synchronizes the two upon control flow instructions using these branch queues that I've discussed. And this is uh, from the paper. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is the single instruction stream that executes a loop. It's called a Lawrence Livermore loop. This was a hot uh, benchmark suite for supercomputers at its time, developed by the, uh, I guess, Lawrence Livermore Labs, right? Um, it does some com computation. It does this computation in a hydro benchmark, I guess. Basically, the compiler divides this into two streams, access and execute. And this is exactly what you would expect. This is the load over here in the access stream. And the load basically loads into the access execute queue. And this, the result is read by the execute stream into this instruction that basically uh, multiplies what is loaded with x2. And you can find it over here. And you can basically follow this code. Basically, now you have two different instruction streams. And they could be independent of each other. Some of the uh, instructions that are over here are independent of the instructions over here. So you can actually do all of these accesses in parallel, I believe, uh, without waiting for anything from the execute stream until here. This is the first place where the execute uh, stream result is required by the access stream, which means that the access stream can go ahead and generate a lot of memory requests while the execute stream is waiting. Make sense? So you have limited form of out of order execution across these two streams. Except you don't need that complicated Thomas Law's algorithm hardware. All, all you need is this. And as you make the queues larger and larger, your latency tolerance increases. OK. So this is actually, uh, there, there have been processors that are designed for this, but they're, they're not general purpose today. But some of the processors, Pentium 4, for example, employ some of the slipping. What they do is they divide uh, instructions into uh, 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 flo uh, integer floating point and memory queues. And these 
can slip with respect to each other. Except the compiler is not involved. The compiler doesn't generate two different streams. It's not exactly the same thing. OK, what is the advantage? Well, I, I already told you. Basically, you can do out of order execution. One stream uh, can run ahead of the other stream. If, a, uh, if access stream takes a cache miss, for example, execute stream may have independent instructions. It can perform useful work. And these two processors can be in order. They don't need to be out of order. Right? If access stream hits in the cache, it supplies data to a lagging execute stream. And queues actually reduce the number of required registers. That's one other advantage. If you look at this, some of the registers that are used over here are now in the queues. So you don't need as many registers over here. So your register pressure goes down also. Basically, you have limited out of order execution without the wake up and select complexity, which is nice. People have proposed uh, to reduce that complexity in other ways, but this is a radical way of doing it. Disadvantage, well, again, you need compiler support, right? You need to have the compiler partition the program and manage the queues. And that determines the amount of decoupling. If the compiler doesn't do a good job, too bad. Uh, the other disadvantage, branch instructions uh, reduce that decoupling, because they require synchronization between the X access and execute streams. Right? Both streams should execute the same piece of code. Uh, well, well, not same piece of code, but same branches. They should not deviate from each other. Well, the other disadvantage is multiple instruction streams. You're really fetching from multiple instruction streams now. But this can actually be avoided. You can be, this can be done with a single one. And in fact, the implemented processors have a single instruction stream. This is uh, the Astronautics ZS1 processor. This company is still uh, in business, I think. They do displays, as far as I know. It was designed by Jim Smith. But basically, you have a single st stream. Let me find out. This is the instruction fetch unit. Uh, and that single stream is steered into execute and access pipelines. And access pipeline is over here. And execute pipeline is over here. Uh, and you can read more about this. But basically, it's the same thing. And uh, this paper talks about the dynamic instruction scheduling techniques. The key is, how do you steer? What, what is the compiler steer over here versus here? And that's, that's basically hinted in the instruction stream. The, each instruction has a tag saying it, it should go to this stream, this pipeline versus this pipeline. And the, the compiler's choices make a big difference because that determines how much stalling you have, how, much, how many dependencies you have between the access and execute streams. Uh, to ensure that you don't do a lot of uh, stalling, uh, there have been a lot of compiler techniques that were developed. Basically, there were several scheduling techniques. There is some dynamic scheduling that happens in this. Uh, what is that? Basically, access and execute streams are issued and executed independently. Right? That's really dynamic scheduling. Because the compiler gives this single instruction stream order, but these are issued and executed independently. Loads can bypass stores in the memory unit. So there is load store ordering. Uh, and this happens if there is no conflict. So a lot of the ideas that we've discussed earlier can actually be applied to this processor. And branches are actually executed early in the pipeline. This processor executes branches early in the pipeline so, so that it can reduce synchronization penalty. If you execute a branch too late, then you may need to flush a lot of the pipeline. Uh, but this works only if a register, if the register branch source is available early on. So for example, if, if you fetch the branch and branch is testing the condition uh, register 4 is equal to register 5, if both registers are available, you can actually access the register file early and execute the branch right. You could do this in an existing processor, too, uh, in, a, in a pipeline out of order processor, too. You just need to ensure that the, those two registers are really available and provide a path to the register file from the front end. Make sense? So this processor actually did that, such that it, it reduced the synchronization penalty between these two different pipelines. There are a lot of static scheduling techniques that were employed also. I'll give you a couple of these. And this will hopefully motivate the next class's lecture as well. Uh, one of them, well, obviously you would like to execute the branch instructions as early as possible, right? So how do you do that? Well, move the branch code as early as possible in the pipeline, right? Uh, or and move the compare instructions as early as possible, such that the branch source register is available when the branch is decoded. So if you want R4 and R5 to be available 
or if you want the branch condition to be available, move the code that generates the branch condition much earlier than the branch. Actually, existing, uh, existing compilers employ this also. Uh, this is a tough thing to do if the branch condition uh, is generated right before uh, the branch, and if you have lots of branches in the code. OK. Uh, well, there's code reordering, of course. And uh, this process has employed loop unrolling as well. Are you guys familiar with loop unrolling? All of you? Yes. OK. Then I can skip the slide, huh? Yes? OK. Basically, you replicate the loop body multiple times. I'll skip the slide because we'll uh, look at that in the next lecture, too. But if you want to learn more about loop unrolling, you can read this slide. OK. Let me cover systolic arrays as well, and then we'll conclude this lecture. That covers all, uh, lots of execution models, hopefully. Now you see how creative people have been in the past. <laughs> this is actually a very fun concept, I think. This was developed at CMU for the first time. Uh, Basically, the idea is uh, like, a, like a heart, if you will. Data flows from the computer memory in a rhythmic fashion, passing through many processing elements before it returns to memory. Memory is your heart, right? It basically pumps data into your veins, and uh, the blood flows through all of your cells, and your cells operate on the blood. Well, or blood enables the operation of the cells. That's another thing. Eventually, blood comes back to the heart and gets pumped again. So you don't need to, the heart doesn't send separate pieces of blood to different cells. Right? That's the key. Well, why is this a good idea? This is similar to an assembly line. Different people work on the same car. Many cars are assembled simultaneously, and this can be two dimensional. We'll take a look at that. So the reason this was developed was uh, mainly this, actually. You, you have imbalanced data and computation. And data access was difficult. If you access memory, and if, you're, uh, if, if you do only one operation on it, you need to access memory again. Right? Whereas if you access memory once, and if you do many, many operations on it, you don't need to access memory as much. So you save memory bandwidth. So the goal was here to co balance computation and I.O. access in special purpose accelerators. And uh, the goal was also to design a simple, regular hardware and, uh, that, that gets you high performance or high concurrency. So let me give you an example. Basically, this is an example from this uh, really nice article that I would recommend to everyone again. H.T. Kong was a professor at CMU at the time when he developed this. But basically, the problem was this. If you have this memory and a single processing element, uh, and if you keep uh, access memory, do processing, write the result back, and then access memory again, do some processing, write the result back. If you keep doing that, you're limited by your memory bandwidth. Right? How many times you can access memory per unit time. Whereas if you can do something like this, if you access memory, get the, do some processing on the data, transform it to something else, send the data to another processing element, Transform, which transforms it to something else, and sends the data to another processing element, which transforms it to something else, dot, dot, dot. And eventually, the data gets written back to memory. You can do a lot more processing over here. So instead of connecting memory and processing elements this way, maybe there's another processing element over here, you chain the processing elements. You pipeline the processing elements. And these are, you can now think of the memory as a heart, and processing elements as the cells, right? And cells are chained together via the veins. Does that make sense? That's the idea. It's kind of nice. Uh, the downside is this processing element that's in the middle now cannot directly access memory, right? You really have to go through this chain. So now you're specializing the architecture. If your computation is nice such that all of the operations need to go through these different processing elements, then that's great because you've saved a lot of memory bandwidth. This model is nice if, for programmability, if you will. Right? Because you can have another processing element connected to memory, another processing element connected to memory, another one connected to memory. And they can all be independent. And you don't need to go through this chain. Now you need to go through this chain. Okay. So when, when is this good, I guess? The basic principle, we're replacing a single processing element with a regular array of processing elements. And we're going to carefully orchestrate flow of data between the processing elements, such that we can accomplish some tasks. 
This achieves high throughput without increasing memory bandwidth requirements. And if you do this calculation here, it says 5 million operations per second at most. At most. Here you can do 30 million operations per second. Uh, so th you can think of this as pipelining, actually, right? You're really pipelining the processing elements. But the difference is uh, you can have this array structure to be nonlinear and multidimensional. If you read this paper, it actually talks about nonlinear arrays. You can have a matrix, for example, and you can input x-axis of the image from the top or y-axis of the image from the top and x-axis from the uh, sides. And you can do a lot of processing. Uh, processing element connections can be multi-directional. They can be different speed. And processing elements can actually have local memory and execute kernels. So this idea of systolic computation has led to what, it, what we will call as staged execution. And I'll, to, I'll, I'll tell you about that. OK. Uh, so where, where is this good at? This was actually developed for image and vision processing. Uh, but one thing uh, that's, uh, that fits nicely is convolution. Have you guys studied convolution before? OK. In your EE courses, e, is it EE 100 or? 290, Two, right? Yes, that's right. Basically, you must know of this, right? It's used in filtering, pattern matching, many, many things. Many image processing tasks, many vision processing tasks, and many other things. So let's take a look at how you can design a systolic array that can basically do this convolution. And this is uh, from the article that I recommended to you. Basically, this is what the systolic array looks like. Uh, you have weights stored in the processing elements, because weights do not change. right? y1 is calculated with weight 1 times x1 plus weight 2 plus x, weight 2 times x2 plus weight 3 plus, uh, times x3. This is how y2 is calculated. This is how y3 is calculated. And they all use weights. So weights are stored in the processing elements. And the data values, the input sequence x is pumped in from this way. Basically, you pump data from memory. x1 is pumped in first. And it arrives at this processing element at this time. And when it arrives at this processing element, y1 is pumped in. And y1 is the output. And the, what the processing element does is, this is what the processing element does, basically. It basically takes x in and outputs it from its x out. And then it also computes this value. Uh, y out, basically going out here, is y in plus weight that's stored in the processing elements times x in. So in the first cycle, when the x1 reaches this processing element, at the end of that, the result will be, I guess, y1 equals, uh, well, the result over here is y1 plus w1 plus x, uh, w1 times x1, right? And then when in the next cycle, x2 will reach this processing element, and the data over here will be w1x1, right? And the end of the next cycle, what you will have over here is w1x1 plus w2x2, right? Does that make sense? And then in the next cycle, x3 will reach this processing element. And the result over here will reach this processing element. And the result will be, so now you have w1 plus x, w1 plus x1. Uh, w1x1 plus w2x2 over here, and you'll add w3x3 over here. So you'll get y1 outputted as this value. Similarly, by orchestrating this y2, well, the next thing that's coming in is actually y2 over here, you'll get the right results. Make sense? OK. If you're, if you're not convinced, take a look at the paper or go through this exercise. But this is basically a very specialized structure that does convolution in a very simple way. Now, the design of the processing elements are really simple. And the paper actually goes into more detail into the design. So you can actually implement the adder and multiplier separately, such that you can, uh, 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 you can overlap adder and multiplier operations. And in this design, actually, you lose some efficiency because you, pump, you can pump in x only every other cycle. And you can pump out data only every other cycle. OK. Make sense? For this kind of computation, at least. Of course, this is very specialized, right? So how do you actually make this more general purpose? Uh, well, first, one thing is you can store multiple weights. right? You, and you can uh, enable the selection of the weights on the fly. Uh, 
or online dynamically. This eases implementation of many methods like adaptive filtering. And taken further, this leads to different programming models. Uh, each processor, processing element can actually have its own data and instruction memory. And people have built machines like that. Uh, the data memory is used to store partial or temporary results that are just needed by the processing element instead of going to memory or constants. And this leads to what's called stream processing or pipeline parallelism today, or more generally, stage execution. I'll briefly talk about that too. Uh, we haven't talked about pipeline parallelism, right? Have you guys programmed this way at all? No? I guess, OK. Well, let me see if I can do justice to it. Well, I can do a very brief justice to it, I guess. <laughs> Basically, you can, uh, this is one way of parallelizing programs. We talk about parallelizing iterations, right? If iterations are independent of each other, you can execute them in parallel. But what if iterations are not independent of each other? Well, portions of iterations may be independent, right? If you look at this, uh, what might happen is uh, this code in stage, uh, you, you may have some code in this part of the loop, some other code here, some other code here. Let's call them stages. And what might happen is these are uh, stage A, stage B, stage C. The w one way you can parallelize this loop is you can divide, uh, you can have the different iterations of the loop executing at different stages like this. And this is, uh, this is uh, the loop's execution on a single processor. You, st you execute stage A from iteration 0, stage B from uh, iteration 0, stage C from iteration 0. And then you go back to stage A from iteration 1, dot, dot, dot. Instead, you can split the loop into three pipeline stages and ensure that different processors execute these different stages. For example, the one reason for this might be you may have some data uh, that's needed just by the stage. And you want to keep that in the caches of that processor. In that case, you actually execute this stage A, but different iterations of stage A on the same processor. And stage B is executed on another processor. Stage C is executed on another processor. And these may be operating on different working sets, different parts of the working set. And the way uh, you get parallelism is you have different processors executing different stages at any given point in time. And the loop execution is really pipelined across processors. A0 executes here in the first time step. B0 executes after it's done. C0 executes after it's done. Make sense? OK. There may, I mean, this works only if you can do this, right? Ideally, you would like to minimize communication between these different stages in a loop. OK. I'm going really fast because I want to finish on time. But you can uh, read about this. One example uh, of stage processing is file compression, for example. This is uh, a, a number of stages. Uh, let's, let's assume that you actually have a loop that compresses lots of files. You give the input or par portions of the files. You give an input file that gets allocated in one stage. And the input is read in another stage. The input is compressed in another stage. And the input is written in another stage. And the, uh, what is allocated is deallocated in the next stage. You can think of this as different stages executed on different processors. And different processors can be specialized for the execution of different stages. And systolic arrays are kind of like that, because you're really getting some input data, transforming it to something else, and executing on it on a processor that can potentially be specialized for that, which is transforming the data and uh, placing it into a queue, if you will, that's executed by the next stage, which is perhaps executed on a processor that's specialized for compression. Right? And then, well, this is a simple example, but you could think of uh, embedded processing, and you could do video decoding, for example. Right? In fact, this is a good way of programming accelerators. You can pipeline the execution of different accelerators such that a program doesn't need to communicate with memory as much. OK, I think I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages quickly. Any questions so far? Okay. This is uh, basically the systolic arrays have led to notions like pipeline parallelism, where you can uh, parallelize the code and specialize the execution of each pipeline stage. The advantages, you can now make multiple uses of each data item. Right? You reduce the need of fetching and refetching. You enable high concurrency as a result. 
And you have a regular design. Both data and control flow is regular. The disadvantage, well, this is true for uh, SIMD processing as well. Right? This is not very good at exploiting irregular parallelism. And it's very specialized. It's relatively special purpose. You need software programmer support to be a general purpose model. Yes? So you say you, know, you reduce the need for needing fetching and refetching. But if you really need to fetch something that many times, wouldn't it just be in the registers? Uh, you may need to fetch different data, right? OK. OK. So I think I'll stop here. You can read about the warp computer, uh, which is basically an implementation of a systolic array, the, the concepts. Uh, we'll, we'll start with that, perhaps, in the next lecture. OK?